This morning we will be talking about deep foundations uh, and uh, as Ali mentioned there will be uh, three parts to my discussion. Um, the slide here shows what those three parts basically are. The first is is a general overview of deep foundations, what they're what they're good for, uh, and uh, and how the design process generally works. I'll have some suggestions as to how that design process uh, can be uh, more effective. In, in part two, uh, we'll talk about uh, about different types of deep foundations: um, drill piles, driven piles, uh, micro piles, etc. And uh, as well as talking about selection of pile types, which types of piles are, are best for which situations. Uh, I'll then discuss some, some of the provisions in the, uh, in the International Building Code Chapter 18, uh, primarily focused on the, on the seismic provisions. I will talk just a little bit about some specific uh, issues that pertain to the California version of the IBC, that is the CBC, uh, as it pertains to uh, schools and hospitals, but only briefly. Um, then I'll discuss pile load testing and interpretation of results. Um, in part three, I'll go through a design example for a cast-in-place concrete pile foundation. So what are deep foundations used for? Primarily, they're, they're used uh, for sites where, where the soils are poor and we need to transfer building loads uh, down to competent soils at depth. This can reduce building settlement. Um, it's also useful that we can provide uplift uh, primarily for lateral loads, uh, ends of shear walls and, and frames where, where that's necessary. Uh, in some cases, we need deep foundations simply because there isn't enough room uh, on the surface of the site to provide the, the bearing strength that we need. Uh, the photograph here of, uh, of some tank foundations shows a, a significant uh, mat of, of piles here that, that's used because, uh, because we needed uh, a lot of bound, uh, bearing pressure that we couldn't get out of the soil. Um, we also use deep foundations where sites are, are subject to consolidation. Um, or to liquefaction in seismic events. So when we when we design deep foundations, uh, we need to uh, have a collaboration between the structural engineer and the geotechnical engineer. Um, the typical process is that when the geotechnical engineer uh, is uh, preparing the soils report, he he determines that he needs piles at the site and asks the structural engineer about typical foundation loads. Then, then the geotechnical engineer will provide in his report allowable pile loads for vertical and lateral. The structural engineer will essentially takes that report uh, uh, verbatim as, as it is and determines the number of piles that he needs based on these allowable loads um, and, uh, and, that's, and, and indicates that the piles need to be able to provide those, those loads uh, on the drawings in the general notes or, or something. Uh, the, the trouble with this process is that there may be a, a range of vertical pile capacities that are possible for the site depending on the length of the piles and the, and the geotechnical engineer will choose what he thinks is a reasonable number but doesn't necessarily know how that is going to affect the overall efficiency of the, of the pile design. Also the resistance to lateral loads is, is, is more complex than, uh, than can be handled in this in this simple unidirectional uh, flow of information. So the vertical loading uh, capacity of piles depends upon the length. And it's very rare that the structural capacity of piles is actually going to control uh, how much load you can put on a pile. It's almost always that the geotechnical uh, capacity is the controlling one. And so the structural engineer can work with the geotechnical engineer to understand uh, that relationship of capacity versus length, and then can determine what the most efficient design can can be uh, based upon a sensitivity analysis, you know, within geotechnical limitations for the site. 